today, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good. Good, oh, you are good, good, oh. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my son. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my song. You are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh. Never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down.
Psalms 42, verses uh, 1 and 2 says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God?
loved you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my heart. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship Thee. You may be seated. First of all, we want to thank uh, the uh, gift given uh, in memory of Cliff Iverson from Debbie and the family that uh, was made so that we can have a radio broadcast today out there. Also, uh, <laughs> like the haunted house version of uh, church. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> So I'd like to share something. Uh, some of you may have heard that I had received a call from another church, and I did. Uh, however, after a prayerful consideration, I've decided that, that God wants me still here. And so I'm happy to say, uh, hopefully you are as well, that I'm going to be here. So I'm not taking that call. Um, so I'll, I'll stay. So, also, um, Dave Finstrom noticed I had a little bit of a glee to me this morning in Sunday school, and it's because we're having our potluck today after church. So if you're able to stick around, whether you brought food or not, you know, we've got a lot of food back there. Please stick around and stay. You don't have to be a member uh, to enjoy the, the great potluck that we have. We are going to have a quarterly business meeting afterwards. Everyone's welcome to stay for that as well. However, for you to vote, you need to be a member. And that brings up, uh, we're going to be having our new member class starting up very shortly. Uh, and that is in the bulletin. Um, it's November, where is it? November 8th. Thank you. We're going to have our new, new members class. So if you are interested in becoming a member, uh, maybe you're not sure you want to be a member, but you'd like to find out more about it, I would strongly encourage you to stick around after church. The new members class will be right after church, starting November 8th. It lasts about six weeks. Uh, and then after that, uh, you'll be taking your vows to join the congregation if you choose. And then you'll have full voting rights and be able to serve in, in all aspects of the church's ministry and life. Also, I just wanted to bring up on Saturday, uh, we have been meeting for prayer. Um, uh, two weeks ago, we met up at the nursing home. Uh, this last Saturday, we met down in the uh, community center. Again, it's going to be at the community center. Uh, as it's getting colder, we're inside. If by chance God blesses us with a really nice warm day next Saturday, uh, we'll be outside around the flagpole. But otherwise, uh, if you're interested in coming, it's at 9 a.m. at the community center. And it's not just Zion, but it's people from the community that are coming to pray. Also, this Friday night coming up and Saturday, we have the uh, uh, men's and boys retreat in, uh, in uh, Epping. And if you're interested in that or have any questions, uh, you can ask me or talk to me, or you can just show up. Uh, we have uh, dinner or supper at, um, in the evening on Friday with a series of lessons. And then we're going to have some more lessons on Saturday, followed by a whole lot of shooting. So we understand if you've got rifles, handguns, shotguns, we're going to have a lot of stuff to be shooting at. Uh, you're, you're welcome to come to that and, and bring some ammunition to, to shoot. Um, also, next Sunday, November 1st, is Daylight Savings Time, so you're going to be falling back an hour. So those of you that come early and forget about Daylight Savings Time, you can clean the church if you want, right? <laughs> but uh, we're, don't forget, we're going to be having that. Also, you'll notice in the bulletin, there's an orange handout. 
And it's sort of like, you know, when you were a, a young child at Christmas and how many of you guys remember the Sears and Robux catalog, right? I love those. Those things were giant. And my mom would give that to me, and she would let me look through it, and I would, I would circle and highlight and, and rip out pages of all the things that we wanted. Think of this as the Sears and Roebuck catalog of the church. Uh, if you have any desire to continue to, to bless us in a unique and special way with the physical things that we need with the church, uh, there's a long list here of things that you can get. And I also know that Lee has an announcement that he'd like to share. As uh, this is Pastor Appreciation Month, the month of October, uh, we have selected this day as uh, Pastor Appreci Appreciation Day for Zion. We are so grateful that he is going to be sticking around with us. That, that was a blessing in itself. Uh, we'd like to thank him for all the work that he's done as far as helping uh, put things together, uh, newsletters and stuff for raising funds for our new church, all the things that he's done, the emotional things that we go through when we're doing a building project to try and keep peace and everything in the church. And it, things have gone, gone pretty well. As you can see, we're in a very nice building that is paid for. Uh, we do have some bills coming in, but uh, pretty much everything is paid for. So we just thank him for helping us achieve that. And for this Pastor's Appreciation Sunday, I'd like to call Brenda forward too, because she is just as important part of our ministry as the pastor is. Amen. <laughs> We have put together a little gift for the family and for pastor. So uh, when you exit to after the church service, please uh, show me your appreciation. There is a table in the outside there with a basket for any cards and cash. So we, we thank you. I wish I could take more credit for the work that's been done around here, but I, I honestly, I um, mean, you know, I was talking to Chuck and Fran and, and before the service, and I, man, did you ever think it was going to get done? And, and uh, we were just kind of talking about the building and the projects, and I, I'm just, I'm glad to be a part of this congregation. And, you know, we are so much stronger as we are united moving forward than we are as a bunch of individuals. And you know, all families get, get into squabbles, and we, we all sometimes have issues. I've got a, a large family, as you know, and uh, we have our share of those. But I'm, I'm very grateful uh, for the ability to come and preach here. And it will be about eight years now, at the end of December, that we'll have been here. And I thought, man, I, I've said this before. I didn't know the difference between a sprayer and a combine. I think Mark must have looked at me and just shook his head. You know, I had a picture of a sprayer thinking it was a combine in one of the, the flyers for the, the building thing. And he's like, why do you have a sprayer? And I'm like, oh, is there a difference? <laughs> so uh, it's, it's been good. And uh, I've really enjoyed it. And uh, my family has. And um, it's, it's a good place to, to raise a family and to live. And I'm so grateful for everyone that, that has helped. And, and I, I can't thank you all enough. So I believe that's all of our announcements. Are there any other announcements? Um, I, I did want to bring up, too, that we have a library in the old church, and it's up on the, the main floor. There's a bunch of books in there, and I don't know if we're going to move any of those up here. We may, we may not. But if you have any books in there that you've been wanting, think, man, this would be really nice. Maybe you've got a library at home. Look through that, and, and please feel free to take some of those out. And uh, and also that top floor, Kay's done a great job of, of cleaning out the church, and it's going to be a never-ending job. We'll probably be doing it for the next year or so. But uh, if there's anything in there that you would like to take home, please feel free to take that. Uh, we, we don't want to throw the, anything away. We'd love for people to take that. But are there any other announcements before we get to our prayer? Yes, Claudia. 
Oh, yes. Yep. So we've been praying for Andrew. Uh, he's he been struggling with cancer for, for quite some time, and uh, he's still a young man. And there's going to be a benefit soup and sandwich for him on November 8th. So that's not next Sunday, but two weeks uh, from today. And that's from 12 to 2. And that's going to be here at the church, correct? Yes. So we got to be able to use our brand new kitchen. So that'll be, that'll be great. Any other announcements we want to bring up? Okay. We want to continue to pray for Andrew uh, for his healing. We should pray for the election, that God's will would be done. Any other concerns that we should be praying for? Yes. Yes. So um, the Nybergs are a family from the first church that served in Minneapolis, and Andy Nyberg has dementia, and she kind of escaped and got into a car and just drove off somewhere. And it's been a week, 24 hours, and they still haven't found her. So her name is Andy uh, Nyberg, so we want to pray for her that she would be found and be healthy. Other prayer concerns. Okay, let's just spend a few minutes as a congregation and pray. Lord, we, um, we are so thankful for this building that we can gather together. Lord, that it's safe. We don't have to worry about walls collapsing or a foundation giving way or something else. And, and Lord, to, to you be the glory for this. Lord, it's, it's not... Not our doing, it is your doing. That we can come here together to worship you in a building that is so beautiful and that we don't owe money on it. And, and what a blessing that that is. Lord, I thank you for the, uh, the gifts that, that you have given us through the hands of so many people in this community and in this, in this church. Father, we also want to pray for, um, for those who are struggling physically. We think of Andrew, Lord, and as he's been struggling with cancer, and we have a benefit coming up to help him and bless him financially. Uh, Lord, we pray that he would have a complete turnaround and he would be healed completely of this cancer, and that you would also um, bless their family so that they're not burdened with, with so many bills that they can't get out from under that, Father. Lord, we also want to lift up uh, Andy Nyberg, and as she is still missing, Lord, we ask that you would um, help her to be found and that she would be healthy and that people would recognize that there's something that's not right with her if, if she's out and about, and uh, Lord, that she would be able to return home to her family and friends and, and, uh, and to be safe. Lord, we also want to pray for the election that's coming up. Uh, Father, we, we ask that your will would be done. Uh, Lord, I, I can't begin to know uh, who the right people are to be elected as president and as senators and representatives and, and even in our local government, Father, that we have needs and, and most importantly, Father, we, we ask that men and women who love you, who want to honor you, uh, who obey your laws, Father, would be elected and, and, and rule over us. And uh, Father, we pray that your will would be done. And we lift up any other silent concerns right now and ask, Lord, that you would hear them. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if the congregation would please stand, if you're able to. Our Old Testament lesson is from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. This was written by King Solomon as he was trying to find fulfillment in things of this world. He said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly. My mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and treasure of kings and providences. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. 
I became became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done, and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. Our epistle lessons from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 8 through 16. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And finally, our sermon text is taken from the short uh, gospel, which is only two verses, Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Here ends the reading of God's word. Let us confess our faith now as found in the words of the Apostles' Creed, which is on the screens before you. And we confess together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. Congregation may be seated. And we now ask the children to come forward for our children's message. Want to help pass them out? Thank you. You guys can all gather around over here. hope we have enough. There's one packet that fell on the floor there. Someone can grab one of those. Do we have enough of them? Hopefully. All right. Wait, you can grab one there. Go ahead, guys. You can get two since you passed them out. Would you put that one in there for me? Thank you. Did everyone get one? Okay, good deal. All right, so what I'm going to talk to you today about is what do we find our fulfillment in? What does it mean to find fulfillment in something? Does anyone know? Find like joy and happiness and you feel like, yes, now that I have this, I'm really, really happy. Have any of you gone on, now there's, there's more, there, have any of you gone on a really special trip, maybe like to Disney World or Disneyland? Has anyone ever gone there? Did you guys feel like when you finally got there, like, this is the best of the best of the best? Did you, ever, did you feel like that? No. Not at the end. All right, it was at the beginning maybe a little bit you did, but not so much at the end. Did you feel like that when you went there? Yeah, okay. How about one of those special presents that you've always wanted? Maybe a toy or 
something else like that. What, what did you get that was like the best thing that you've ever gotten? Two more Nintendo Switch controllers. Wow. Now that you have that, you can fully use your Nintendo for all of its potential, right? Now, do you feel like completely fulfilled in everything in your life now because of that? No. What well, kind of for now? Now, what about you guys? When you guys went to Disney World, now you know that you've been completely fulfilled and you're walking on water. No, that's, that's not how you feel. I don't know if the feedback is because we're on. All right. Well, what I'm going to talk to you guys about is that Solomon was a man who had everything. He had money. He had power. He had all the toys he could have wanted. And this was really bad. You know how many women that he more or less was kind of married to? Over a thousand. Oh, my word. That was not good, right? And you know why he did all of this? He thought, if I can only get what I want, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be fulfilled. Right? He went on trips and, and explored the lands, and, and that never really satisfied him. And then he got, like, toys and gifts and stuff, and that didn't satisfy him. And he thought, if I can have as many wives as I can imagine, then I'll be happy. He wasn't happy even then. What did he need to do? to finally find fulfillment and be happy. What do you think? Believe in God and find his peace with God, right? Guys, sometimes we think in our minds that if we just get that next toy or if we just do that next thing or if we go to that one place that we've always wanted to go, then we'll be fulfilled. But the reality is if we're doing that to find our fulfillment, it's not going to be enough. What God tells us is to love him and to meditate on his laws and his precepts and, and basically to read the Bible. And then when we find our fulfillment in God, then we will finally be happy and then we will have our peace in our life. And that's what Solomon needed to figure out. So if you guys get nice gifts at Christmas time or if you go on fun trips, you should enjoy that stuff and, and be happy about it. But don't look for that to give you peace in your life. Because the only way that you're going to get peace and fulfillment in your life is to have who there? Jesus. That's right. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. You can have a seat. You didn't? Why don't you grab one? You, you don't like these kind? All right. Sorry. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of every present heart be acceptable to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I found that in life there are times when what appears to be easy and simple is a lot more complex and difficult than you realize. And I think one of the greatest examples of this, believe it or not, is making eggs. Now some of you are thinking, come on now, Pastor, I've made eggs before. They're not all that tough. But what I'm talking about is making the perfect omelet. If you ask a chef, someone that really knows about cooking, is making a really good omelet easy or hard, they'll tell you very clearly, it is very difficult don't get me wrong, anyone can pretty much make eggs. It's not that hard. And anyone can kind of put together an omelet. But what I'm talking about is to do it so it is elevated and it is perfect. You know, there's this young French chef that, that sometimes when I'm on YouTube or the internet or whatever, I'll occasionally watch. And he's, he really interests me for some reason. And, and he was watching a video of this old French guy making an omelet. He says, this is said to be really difficult and, and I'm going to make it. And he tried over and over and over and over to make an omelet that was perfect. And he continually failed. And I thought, come on, is it really that hard to make an omelet? As I know some of you are thinking, no, pastor, an omelet's not. You crack some eggs, you stir it in there, you flip it over, you're good to go. But I, but I researched this a little bit. Some of you are thinking, we're paying him to research how to make an omelet, right? That's crazy. But, but to do an omelet right... You use a pan and a fork. 
Those are the only two instruments that you use. And, and, and then the chef listed what makes making an omelet so hard. He says you have to have the perfect amount of heat. You need enough to set the eggs, but not so much that they get hard. You need to have the perfect texture of an omelet. You don't want to overcook the eggs, and you don't want to beat too much air into them. The touch of the omelet. You need to use the perfect amount of butter to make an omelet feel luxurious, but not rich. You need to use the perfect amount of salt to bring out the flavor of the eggs, but not to hide it. You also need the right technique. You need to be able to roll the omelet perfectly around and have the right amount of patience and heat and touch and skill. Then he said, you need to have the right amount of time. You've got to be able to gauge the time perfectly. The eggs can only cook so long before they overset, and it becomes more of a burnt egg. And if you cook it too little, it's too wet and won't have its shape. And then the omelet has to have the perfect finish. An omelet that is good should be slightly wet, perfectly molded, and glistening. Now, I know some of you are saying, okay, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to practice making a perfect omelet. Maybe you want to do that. But I didn't realize how difficult something apparently, maybe, is so easy to make. And the reason why I'm talking about this and describing how to make a good omelet is, is that I feel that, that that concept is what mirrors the sermon text today. I'm preaching from, from just two verses. And I, and I have to admit, when, when I picked this text out, I thought, oh, this is going to be an easy thing. and I'm, I'm going I'm to bust this sermon out and, and it's going to be just simple. But I'm telling you, I was working on this till late on Saturday. At first glance, it, it, it appears to be very simple, this, this parable that, that Jesus spoke. And if you like to follow along, it's in Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 and 46. Jesus had been out, and he'd been teaching the crowds, and they had been following him. And as the day wore on, the, the text in the context describes how Jesus retired into a house, probably to have a meal. Maybe it was an omelet, and then he was going to rest. And while inside, the, the disciples, the followers of Jesus, began to, to ask him, Jesus, what did, that, what did that one parable meant? You know, the one about the field and, and the weeds. And Jesus explained it to them. And after Jesus explained that parable, he continued to teach his followers some other stories and parables. And one of these is this, Matthew 13, 45 and 46. Jesus said this, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. And as I shared, I believe these verses are much like an omelet. I mean, Jesus simply says that the kingdom of heaven is like a pearl merchant. And after finding the most precious and valuable pearl that she could ever find, sells everything that she owns in order to possess that one pearl of great worth. The simple explanation is that, that we should pursue the kingdom of heaven like the pearl merchant and dedicate it all that we have for the kingdom of heaven. It would not be wrong, in fact, to say that that's kind of the base meaning behind this. But I believe if we pause and just think a bit more about these two verses, we'll begin to see golden nuggets and precious rubies that, that are just below the surface that we've got to mine out, that we have to begin to, to really think hard on to understand. The first question I believe we need to ask is, what did Jesus mean when it's recorded here in Matthew, when he says that the kingdom of heaven, what is he talking about? Is he talking about when we, when we get to heaven? I mean, after we die, I mean, I, I just did Ellen Fox's, uh, the family service, and, and we had the committal at, at Norman, and, and it was very sad to, to think of her passing, but, but now as she believed and trusted in Jesus Christ, she's more alive than ever, and she's in heaven. Is that what Jesus was talking about? Or is Jesus referring to his future earthly reign when, when he returns again? Or is he talking about something completely different? What does it mean when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven? Well, for starters, the kingdom of heaven is a unique phrase found only in the gospel of Matthew, the way that it's used here. The phrase kingdom of God is used in other gospels and it very likely means the same thing. And it's likely that Matthew said the kingdom of heaven instead of the kingdom of God so as not to cause irritation to the Jews. 
You know, Matthew, when he wrote his gospel, he wrote it with the mindset of thinking about, you know what, how are the Jews going to understand this? I mean, you open up the gospel of Matthew, and how many of us have done that? We, we, we get at that chronology, and we, and we read all the names and the birth orders, and we just say, what, skip, right? We, we, we've been guilty of that. I've been guilty of that. But the reason why that was there is because the Jews needed to know and understand that the lineage of Jesus goes all the way back to David because that was promised. That was really, really important to them. And likewise, the Jews held the very name of God in such reverence. Oh, how I wish we were like that today. I hear God's name taken in vain so flippantly. But the Jews were not like that. They wouldn't even speak the name of God. And Matthew, knowing this, would have probably said, you know what, instead of saying kingdom of God, I'm going to say kingdom of heaven. So if you're reading through the Gospels and you read the phrase kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven, they likely mean the same thing. But after all of this, we're still faced with that same question, what did Jesus mean? And while it is debated by some, it appears that most believe that this is referring to God's sovereign rule. What does it mean when we say that that God is sovereign? It means that that he is ultimately in control. And in this phrase, kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, it leads the hearer to reflect that God has complete dominion or rule. But as you read the entire Bible, and especially the New Testament, we come to an interesting question. Jesus was being questioned by Pilate, and and he was on trial. This was right before he was crucified. And John writes of this account in his gospel in chapter 18, verse 36. And, And Pilate and Jesus are conversing a little bit, and Jesus replies, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. So it's kind of... Difficult to understand. What in the world does Jesus mean then when he says the kingdom of heaven if Jesus simply says my kingdom is not of this? And and, and how does that work if we say that God is sovereign and in control and yet Jesus says my kingdom is not of this earth? Now my understanding of what Jesus meant when he was referring about this is not something just about the future. It would make little sense for Jesus to spend so much time teaching about what his future kingdom will be like. He wanted his followers now to know how to live their lives. He wanted his followers now to understand what was it to be part of the kingdom of heaven now. And while, yes, Jesus' kingdom is not of this world, it is true, though, he is still sovereign. That means that he still has power and he still has ultimate authority over all kingdoms here on this earth. What Jesus wanted his followers to understand is that right now, as a follower of Jesus Christ, that you are a citizen of his. And that while God has the ultimate power and authority over all kingdoms and powers, God has for a time allowed human and even demonic authorities power within set boundaries to operate. At the end of time, when Jesus returns to earth again, he will come as the conquering king, and he will put all governments, all powers, and all authorities under his complete and total control. No longer will rulers violate God's laws and do what is evil. All will be made right. But Paul wrote that that, that there's a change that's going to take place. That that right now, that yes, God is sovereign, but he's not exercising his complete sovereignty over the governments right now. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 26, Paul writes this, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in turn. Now what he's saying is is that, that there's an order, there's a turn to this. He says, Christ... The first fruits. Christ rose from the dead. The first fruits were those who followed after him. And then when he comes, those who belong to him, those who are still alive when Jesus comes back, will be taken up to him. And then verse 24 says, Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet, The last enemy to be destroyed is death. 
Jesus is in power now. He is in authority now. But it's more passive. He allows things to happen, not because that's his desire, but because he has given us this horrible ability to choose sinful things, to rule in sinful ways. But one day, Jesus will move from a passive control to an active control and make all things right. So to come full circle, when you read your Bibles and you come across the phrase kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, what it's talking about is referring to believers living right now, where we live, how we live. As citizens of God's earthly kingdom, we are waiting for the final fulfillment, the completion of Christ restoring all dominion and authority for himself. But as we wait for that... As we wait for God to restore the world and reign actively over all, we acknowledge that for a time, God has granted limited authority to earthly and even demonic demonic powers to have partial authority. And as Christians, we are called to live in subjection to earthly powers unless that earthly authority calls us to violate God's law. And then, as citizens of God's kingdom, we must choose first to obey God's law over man's law. Jesus wanted, to he- wanted his hearers then, as well as he wants us today, to live our lives as members of his kingdom and to act accordingly. And even though we are called to live to the standards he sets for us, we recognize that we fall short, don't we? I mean, how many times have you read the Bible and you felt convicted? Man, I just haven't been doing that very well. Even though we have a standard to live by, even though we are citizens of his kingdom here and now, the truth is, is that we will fall short of those standards. And what helps us as we fall short of those standards, as we recognize that we fall short, is called the gospel, the good news. That we are not saved because of our ability to follow God's standard, but rather we are saved because Christ kept the standard for us. And yet this doesn't give us license to live however we want. For we as Christians are citizens of a heavenly kingdom. We are not children of the devil, but children of the Lord. And as such, we are called to bear good fruit and live lives demonstrating that fruit. So as Jesus taught about what it was to live in the kingdom of God, he was teaching us how now shall we live. And he uses Matthew 13, 45 through 46 to help us to understand that we all should pursue the kingdom of heaven right now with a zeal and a gusto. (laughs) Have you ever been to a professional game of anything? I remember my, my first Pittsburgh Penguin game I went to in the Civic Arena in Pittsburgh. And we sat in box seats. Because the, the, the guy that got his tickets, his dad would own a beer distributor. He had a lot of money. And we went up in these this great box seats. And there's so much energy and excitement. And everyone was excited. We're rooting for the Penguins. And this was back when they had Mario Lemieux and Yamir Yager and all these great players. And I remember the excitement around me and the excitement that I felt. Do you ever feel like that coming to church? Oh. Do you ever feel like that when you're worshiping? Do you ever feel like that when you're having your quiet times and reading your Bibles? Sometimes we don't, do we? We start thinking about the the pot roast we have in the oven. We start thinking about that that job that we left kind of undone. We start thinking about the argument we got in with our spouse or our children, and it crowds out. Don't get me wrong. We're going to have times of of dryness in our lives, but, but I believe that God desires for us to pursue him and his kingdom with zeal and gusto, like like what I felt when I went to that Pittsburgh Penguins game. How would you act if you searched your whole life for that perfect thing, fill in the blank, whatever that thing is, but you search your whole life for it, and then you find it, and you realize that this thing that you've wanted is very expensive. Not just kind of expensive, super uber expensive. You, you, you figure it out and you realize the only way that you can obtain this thing that you've pursued your life for is to sell all that you have. Will you do it? Would you do it? 
And Jesus looks at his followers and he says, this is how you should pursue the kingdom of heaven. When you found the best of the best and you realize that you don't need to look over the fence anymore because, hey, this is it. The grass is not greener on the other side. It is right before you. It doesn't get better. I tell you sitting here today, if you have faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord, you have achieved the greatest victory of all eternity. Don't look for fulfillment anywhere else. Your fulfillment is in Christ. But some here today doubt me. If I only had that better job, if I only made more money, if I only had that new car, truck, boat, house, <laughs> fill in the blank, then I will have reached the pinnacle. Then I will find fulfillment. And others say, no, it's not in stuff. It's in a pill. It's in a bottle. And still some say, no, no, no. To find true fulfillment, it's in with something else, with someone else. Sexual conquest, getting the right man or woman or combination will allow you to achieve that final victory that your heart yearns for. But I'm here to tell you that your heart may yearn for something right now. But if it's anything other than a right relationship with God, it's a desire that once it's consumed will not give you fulfillment. And some say, well, pastor, how do you know? I've never had it all. But I've read about a guy that did. Solomon. Right? Old Testament. King Solomon, he was a man who had the ability to have everything he wanted and then some. And he started off strong in the faith. But over time, he didn't believe that fulfillment was found in God. It's in something else. So he sought after everything that his heart yearned for. He said, surely in his heart, if I just get that one more thing, then I will find fulfillment. And as I read that Old Testament scripture, I hope it resonated with you. Between wives and concubines, he had over a thousand women. Didn't bring fulfillment. He had so much wealth that gold and silver, the Bible says, were like commonplace metals in Jerusalem. That didn't bring fulfillment. He had unchallenged power. He was the monarch he was the king, and being king was good, but it didn't bring fulfillment. He pursued knowledge and wisdom. Early on in his, his career, he asked God to bless him with supernatural wisdom, and people would come from all over the land to, to sit at his feet just to hear the wisdom that he would speak, and that wasn't enough. So what did he do then? He continued to strive for more, more stuff. He built buildings. He planted vineyards. He had huge tracts of cultivated land, of orchards and vineyards, but nothing fulfilled him. Listen to these words of a man that continued to search for fulfillment outside of a simple relationship with God. He wrote these words. I deny myself nothing my eyes desired. And when he says that, he literally means nothing. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor. And this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. Chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained other, under the sun. What is it like to chase after the wind? You can't see the wind. You can run after it and try to grab it. But you won't have it. It's meaningless. So I close my message today with just a simple question. Is Jesus enough? If you right now are a follower of Jesus, is it enough? Will you find your fulfillment in the relationship with your Savior? Will you be like that pearl merchant who sold all that she had to find that thing that she valued most. And when she found it, she found fulfillment. 
Will you seek first the kingdom of God and allow God to add all the other things that he sees fit to your life? That's biblical. Or, perhaps you have faith in Jesus now as well. But you don't believe me. You don't believe Solomon. You don't believe the Bible that that God will give you what you need but maybe not always what you want. And you say, but if only I had this, if only I looked differently, if only I I bought this thing, if only I had this person in my life, then you may not admit it. But if you live your life with the phrase, if only I had, you will always have emptiness. And if that is you, I beg you to heed the words of Solomon. Don't go down the same path that he did, searching for fulfillment in something other than God, because it won't ever be enough. And if right now you're not a part of the kingdom of heaven here on earth, if you still haven't placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your king, I ask you the simple question, what are you waiting for? Tomorrow may never come for you. Cry out to God while you still can. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words. Lord, we thank you that you have patience with us. Because so often, Lord, we we are fooled into thinking that, that if only we had, then we would be fulfilled. Oh, Lord, our fulfillment needs to be found in you. Help us to pursue your kingdom here on earth as we look forward to your grand kingdom in heaven. Father, be patient with us. And if we're clinging to something that that we are hoping will give us fulfillment, Lord, help us to let go of that. Help us to understand that all we need to do is place our trust and our hope in you. Help us to find the joy of simply living for you. And Lord, whether we have plenty or very few, help us to find our fulfillment. And let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'm on on green. Hey, there we are. All right, a little whistle to wake you up after that sermon. (laughs) If you're all willing and able, please join us in standing as we sing our closing hymn, number 390 in the hymnal, if you want to follow along there. The doxology. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Receive the benediction. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Um, And now we're going to do the table prayer. Um, We picked the doxology before we knew there was going to be a potluck today. So we're doing the same thing again, but with different words. So it's going to be with... uh, It's going to end in May Feast in Paradise with Thee.
present at our table, Lord, be here and everywhere adore. These mercies blessed and grant that we may feast in paradise with thee. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.